Welcome back to Comic Jitsu. It's time for another edition of Superhero Spotlight. I'm JT McRoberts, and I'm going to walk you through this one. And today, we're going to shine that spotlight once again on the great Prince Namor of Atlantis. Here we see him on the cover of Golden Age Marvel Comics. He was, of course, one of the first Marvel superheroes. I believe the Human Torch was the first, and Submariner was the second. He was the second first, as you might say, because they were among the first of the original Marvel superheroes. What would become the Marvel superheroes? Because, of course, at the time, it was timely comics. Anyway, so Submariner, Human Torch. They had their crossovers. We actually talked about this uh, when we looked at the other Marvel Treasury Edition. And, of course, Captain America... Some other folks there. Back in those classic, classic stories. I never did look up her name. Liberty Girl? What is it? I don't remember. But there we see the great Red Skull. But today we're not looking at that. We're going to look at another classic by the almighty Kirby Lee duo. Jack Kirby. On penciling and plotting. Stan Lee. On the scripting. Or the... Uh, I don't know if, if you'd actually call it a full script or what. I mean, we know he put the dialogue in. He put the words and dialogue in. But Kirby would, would write his own ideas down in the margins. Here we have a nice uh, classic introduction by Stan Lee. An interesting thing here is Stan says that the Fantastic Four was the first superhero comic to feature continuing stories or what he calls novel length stories for the first time and we were the first to introduce rotating guest stars such as Submariner, the Hulk, Spider-Man, and Daredevil. I don't know if that's actually true. I mean something like those early Fantastic Four stories did have multi-parts to them um, and there were kind of occasionally recurring narrative threads and of course repeating villains and guest stars and all that most definitely but those early dc comics you know they had guest stars as well i mean those guys teamed up and into things like the justice society or whatever it was called during that world war ii and later era but here we have the wonderful marvel treasury edition again now someone has signed inside my book honestly i can't tell you where i got this I think I just bought it online. No, I got this at a, uh, I got this at a comic convention. This was probably uh, an early Heroes Con score. Of course, Heroes being the, the great comic convention that we have here in Charlotte, North Carolina, where the comic book dojo is based. And you see, uh, New splash page artwork. I don't know if that's rip. If that's a. Uh, it's not original. I'm guessing. I don't know. It might be from the inside of an annual. I can't really say, so I don't want to speak out of turn. But this was another one of those early Fantastic Four stories that I read in those Digest magazines where I first consumed all of those those original Marvel superhero stories as a as a little person as a little person just looking for a great imaginative works I mean at the time I suppose I had seen like the Fantastic 4 cartoon on TV um I'd seen the some of their guest appearances on other cartoons there was a uh, the Thing had his own cartoon for a while in the late 70s. Thing Ring, do your thing. That was kind of weird. Because he was different than the Thing on the actual Fantastic Four cartoon. And that original cartoon in, from the 60s was actually a pretty faithful adaptation to, this, to, the, uh, to the TV screen. 
because they just took Jack Kirby's works and put them on TV. So anyway, here we go. They warn us about the upcoming team up of Doctor Doom and the Submariner. Again, you have the the Marvel method of storytelling established here by the great Jack Kirby, where he's reminding everybody of everyone's powers right in the opening. Uh, I know Stan definitely takes credit for saying every comic book is somebody's first comic book, and there's no telling who he actually heard heard that from or who who coined it originally, but. They definitely, they followed that old adage and made sure you in, reintroduce the powers every single time as if somebody was completely unfamiliar with the Fantastic Four. And this is a cool issue because the plot line winds up featuring the, the Baxter building, okay, their headquarters, right? So not only do they introduce the individual Fantastic Four powers, they also introduce the powers of the Baxter building itself. So this is cool. You've got the orbit plane hangar, the fantastic copter hangar, the elevator shaft leading to the hangars. And all this just makes sense. This is so cool. I mean, that Jack Kirby would design this. And this is just pure Jack Kirby, molten imagination, blasted onto the page here. And uh, I'd be curious to see, you know, the original pencils for this and see if he actually wrote these ideas in in the margin because I bet you he did and uh, Stan probably had to follow him pretty closely trophy room the ammo room <laughs> so right there they're telling you the notion you know giving you the idea that uh, the Fantastic Four has weaponry you know there's an ammo room computers electronics you might not be able to see that quite as well there we go chemical laboratory Here, here uh, Reed Richards shows off his stretching ability, his elasticity, and there the thing's strength, just bending steel. Again, he could have just ripped a phone book in half like they asked Namor to do in uh, his return to the Fantastic Four. But no, they're going to try to give you an idea of how strong the thing really is. And the thing is in that, uh, I think he's in the 100-ton range, the 75-ton to 100-ton range. That is, you know, based on those old uh, Marvel Universes and the Marvel Superheroes um, role-playing game from TSR and the Marvel Universes in those because they were all kind of produced kind of concurrently. Those Marvel Universes came out and they broke down all the superheroes and the supervillains' abilities in supposedly like real-world ways, you know, told their training and, and um, you know, what their special abilities were and and, you know, how much they could lift. And then all that was translated over into the role-playing game where they literally had to make it concrete in, in stats and stat numbers. So pretty cool if you're a nerd and a geek who likes that kind of stuff. But that's what we like here on Comic Jutsu. So anyway, folds up the steel, hands it back to him here, the thing, the Human Torch is shocked. Wow! <laughs> that Like they've never seen them him do that before. And this is like issue... Is it issue six? I forget. I was looking at a couple different ones. Um, which is the follow-up to Dr. Doom's initial appearance. So anyway, um, you have to catch up with Namor pretty pretty early. I love how Kirby just shows his... Uh, just his kind of his playful, innocent side. Of Namor. Here he's just out swimming with dolphins and they're jumping and he's doing swimming formations with them. And just without a care in the world, he's completely carefree, just the, the free living human. And uh, it really gets a lot of Namor's character across because in storytelling, you always want to, uh, if you're not moving the plot forward, you want to try to introduce the characters at the very least. Here he is backflipping up out of the water. And Dr. Doom decides to buzz him here. So it looks like he, he he flew his plane pretty close to Namor there. But this is great storytelling where you break the plane between the air and the water beneath. And you see uh, Namor swimming, breaking into the water beneath. It's pretty good stuff. Also, yeah, I just went right over it. But also the inking on these waves. This is good looking stuff. I mean, I wonder if 
if they went from some sort of photo reference to get that. I mean, because if those shadows aren't right, you know, it, it would be easy to confuse this uh, this for something else. I mean, it could just look like a, a barren wasteland, if not water. But, you know, you do have the, the colorist come in there on top of it to solidify it. And here they meet. And right away, they're shaking hands. I mean, you, you see this constant advancement of the story in the, in the pictures that Jack Kirby put on the page. So at this point, you know, Stan had to catch up and had to have a reason for them shaking hands. And it's because Dr. Doob just steps out and he goes, behold the face of your new ally and puts his hand out. Apparently never fear. I am strong, strong enough to join the powers of science to those of darkness. <laughs> this is great. How can they, have they not been able to do Dr. Doom right in the major fantastic four films? I mean, what a joke. If that doesn't, if that's not an indictment of the, the Sony filmmaking, I don't know what is, man. Just the greatest Marvel supervillain just ever. I mean, Dr. Doom, he, he's it because of the costume. And they can't manage to put him on the big screen, right? They always have to fine tune it and just screw it up. The reason those early MCU movies were great is because they tried their best to adapt those stories, to follow the original tales as they were told. And that's why we're shining the superhero spotlight on Namor and these these early appearances here because they could have made great blueprints for a, a future MCU project, but more than likely we're, we're never going to see this kind of stuff. So anyway, here's Doom following Namor back beneath the sea. I mean, uh, you know, Kirby puts in just enough elements here. You know, you see the little underwater mounds and the shoals of fish. There's a <laughs> some sort of squid or octopi some sort of ugly fish there the coral reefs formations and uh doom follows namor back to the ruins of uh of namor's atlantis and doom says you know he, he basically says everything that namor wants to hear that you know the the humans were humanity was wrong and destroying your your world and you can take revenge and I'll help you take revenge. And here's great visual storytelling. Again, you see doom looking at Namor's framed picture of Sue storm. That's so funny to me. It's like, where did he get that? Did he, uh, you know, did Sue storm give that to him? And, uh, or did he clip it out of the newspaper? Did he take a picture? I mean, it's really funny though. I was never a huge fan of the really big forehead that Jack Kirby would do on, Sue Storm. I know that's sacrilege, but it always just looked odd to me. It was like it was a little bit too big. But anyway, I mean, who am I to talk? But look at all this. I mean, I just love the, the underworld organic design and how he's living. Pretty much like SpongeBob, you know. I mean, they just stole <laughs> everything for SpongeBob from uh, the original Prince Namor of Atlantis. Here you go, recapping the story again, in case you're not familiar. And by this time, uh, everything that Doom is saying gets to Namor. And you can see him go through a torrent of emotions until he makes his mind up. Doom immediately explains his super secret weapon. This stuff uh, came out pretty concurrent with the James Bond films. So the notion of like these evil bases and super secret weapons were, were always a big influence on this Marvel era of storytelling. And uh, he says, this is my grabber. I mean, now this could easily be rescripted and just call this, I don't know, reverse gravity neutralizer or whatever, instead of just a grabber where it doesn't sound quite as, as corny. And, uh, you know, it could still have the same effect, which, ma which makes it pretty cool. And apparently this thing can just lift up anything. It causes it to just break free of the Earth's gravitational pull. So there you go. That's his big plan is to use his grabber. On the Baxter building, which we already saw introduced earlier. Here you have Namor leaving his home, flying up, teasing that he's going to run into this plane. This was kind of a an odd moment, but it does, it continues revealing bits of the character of Namor now that he's decided to take his revenge. He doesn't care if he frightens these people, you know, he's going to be reckless. He's not just out swimming with the dolphins anymore. He's made up his mind. 
And here you see he makes his way into New York, and man, nobody could do a crowd like Jack Kirby. I mean, Kirby's New York crowds, they they just teem with life. Look at all the expressions are different, the hands, but the emotions are, are clearly red, and I just love the visual flow of this, how he commands everything to come to Namor in the center of uh, the panel there. You can see people are turning on Namor at this point. And here, again, int introducing a character on the page and then having them, boom, show up, this pre-introduction. So here, Johnny finds Sue's picture of Prince Namor. And I remember reading this as, as a, a little kid. You know, I mean, I'm talking little, like between first and second grade. And these were some of the earliest real comics that I'd ever read, even though they were in that digest size. And I remember seeing this and I mean, I have vivid memories of reading this, you know, I mean, it just, it translated the, the, the notion of the, you know, this attraction between them because it's presented in such a visual manner. It's not just her saying, Oh, I have feelings for Namor. I mean, here they actually show it and they have Johnny confront Sue, you know, she even uses her invisibility here, reminding you of her power. To try to get it away from uh, from Johnny. Johnny sets it on fire. Again, this is showing the emotion. This is just great stuff. I mean, this is Jack Kirby unbridled. He's just telling this story, zipping across the page and trying to make it as visually interesting and imaginatively engaging as possible. Namor's pre-introduced. Boom! There he is by the end of the page. And it's like, wow, we were just talking about you, Namor. That's so funny to me. I mean, they just went for it. They did not care. And here you go. Part three. There was probably a, like a battery of uh, advertisements between pages there. And then we come back for this part. This was interesting that they would break up all these old uh, stories into parts and chapters, which, which I guess correlates to the kind of the anthology format that a lot of their books were in you know, in years previous to this, in the Fantastic Four and those early Spider-Man and whatnot, they're a way where um, they're part of that transition from chapters and parts into into one storyline. So anyway, back to this. Again, you're telling the whole story. They're not just talking heads saying, we're mad at you, Namor. No, I mean, you see it. The thing wants to get his hands on him so badly that Reed Richards has to hold him back by... Yeah, wrapping himself uh, around him. And here you see uh, Sue is in between them. Namor stands defiant, undeterred. Great body language there from Jack Kirby on Namor. See the human torch using his power. He decides to burn a hole in the floor. That's pretty crazy. He just destroys his own building. And, and this was strange here. Uh, Torches. He says, uh, oh, "I can resist your flame, and you'll you'll run out of time in your in your fiery form." And then Johnny Storm, uh, you can see, is transforming back into his un non flaming self. And uh, you see the dialogue agrees with that notion. He says, "My flame has run its time limit. I'm changing back to human form. I failed, failed." Boy, that's old Stan trying to earn his pay right there. Putting that pathos in there. Man. And then here you go. They realize something is going wrong. If Namor's here, he must be up to something. So Reed goes to his security room, looks in all the rooms, inside, outside, and then suddenly, well, first Namor's like, see, I didn't do anything. I'm I'm just here to profess my love for Sue which they leave him with Sue, which is funny. And then, crack, and you hear the building, the foundation breaking, I suppose. And the building, it's rising into the air, the dialogue tells the story. You know, and they don't worry too much at all about any science or physics in this, because the building would probably break apart. Plus, I mean, like all of the, you know, connections beneath would have had to have broken, you know, <laughs> the 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 sewer connections, water connections, 
electricity, the phone line, just everything. So it's pretty crazy, but they're just like, ah, eh, don't worry about this. Just follow it and go along. I'm sure Jack is drawing this and saying, yeah, Stan, put some words on this. Though, you know, Kirby seemed to never be shy about, you know, putting his own words on the page. I mean, this, if you ever see his reproductions of his, of his work, which um, if you're a fan of that, definitely check out the Jack Kirby Collector, which is where I originally saw a lot of that stuff. You'll see he has suggestions for dialogue or explanations for what's happening. He just writes it in the margins, so it's pretty cool. I love this. You have this shoal of fighter jets just flying uh, beneath it. It tells so much story just in this one panel. You get you know, Dr. Doom's trap where he's uh, using his grabber to send the Baxter building into outer space. And then you also have this, uh, this military formation where no doubt uh, the people are concerned about what's happened to the Baxter building. You know, they always tied it back into their world. It's not just happening. It's not just happening in an uh, isolated fashion. Here, Doom fly flies his plane, leading the, the grabber and the trapped Baxter building into outer space. And this is crazy. At least they they pay it a little bit of attention to things. Like, they don't show off the vacuum here. Like, we don't instantly get everyone sucked out. <laughs> because there's no, you know, there's no air dock here. Um, but uh, they do remind you that there's no oxygen in space. So, Johnny can't maintain his flaming form. And he starts to drift back to Earth. And get pulled back into the, uh, the gravity of Earth. So, Reed uses his... His power to pull him back. Pretty cool stuff. But yeah, nobody's getting sucked out into the vacuum of space there. But this is all good stuff and very tense. Love the great use of uh, Mr. Fantastic's stretching power here and the way that Kirby positions him in the panels and across the page. I mean, this whole page is about just about his power. And you see him zipping through... All the way across the page. Sorry, that's what my my visual flows sound like. Marvel Treasury Edition stamped up there in the corner. Just in case you forgot. Like I said earlier, I just love these Treasury Editions. They're a lot of fun. Doom turns on his afterburners. Burns Reed's hands. They pull him back. Your thing grapples with Submariner. This is all your fault. Trading good blows. Here you see good grappling here. See You see uh, almost a Greco-Roman knuckle lock, except um, Submariner has uh, grabbed things wrist here, and here he's got kind of got him by the hand. So just good, good wrestling type stuff. And here good infighting by the thing. Gets off a uh, probably a left hook on the inside there. So good stuff. You can see that there's there's a lot of power, and uh, yeah, this is just this is just a wild slobber knocker going on between these two. Like neither one is budging, but they're both they're both going at it in that short frame there. Doctor Doom continues flying it out in space. So between there and there, <laughs> between those panels, Submariner's like, I don't want to die either. So you know, I'll just jump in this. Uh, this compact water tank that you have here and revivify myself jumps in the water gets stronger and then here this is so cool they don't try to explain it in words at all it's just and now he explodes along with the water out into space but there's a a meteor shower passing by and he's able to use the uh the meteor shower to jump from meteor to meteor to try to catch up to to Dr. Doom's plane. I mean, they set that premise up like really, really quickly. I mean, there, there is no explanation of how any of this works between these three panels. They just go with it and then they go, go, go. <laughs> and I have such vivid memories of reading all of this. Like if I didn't have this in front of me now, I can still visualize this entire story. And, and a lot of these moments where Kirby uses that psychic energy on his page to tell his story uh, you see the way that namor grows bigger and bigger and bigger just commanding the page it's all about him all about his power and uh, that's what he has to use to catch up to dr doom 
smashes his way in. Doom shocks him. But then we find out the shock goes back at Doom. And Namor actually absorbed it because he has the ab abilities of a, an electric eel as well. He can absorb electrical shocks. And then he redirects it back at Dr. Doom. So there you go. New power, just boom, right out of nowhere. They're not concerned about that at all. And they just go with it. But to me, again, it's great. I mean, it's it's a bit of a deus ex machina. But, you know, Namor had to, uh, he had to admit he was wrong. He had to come up with an idea. He had to try to implement it before all of this happened. So it's not such a bad deus ex machina. But anyway, because he overcomes Doom... Doom tries to escape and grabs onto one of the meteors, gets sucked out into space. And so this is actually followed up on in another storyline um, about what happens to Doom while he's away and then his eventual return to Earth. I think it's only a couple issues later, but they don't just forget about it. So it's cool stuff. Baxter Building floats back down to where it was, where it belonged, back into its footprint. Everybody sits and reminisces and thinks about uh, what just happened. They make up at the end here. Of course, they find Dr. Doom's little device. Thing has to use... Uh, that, well, they show that Thing could, can't even pull it loose, but eventually breaks free on its own and flies off following the ship and Namor, and Namor dumps it into the waters. He's just like, eh, I'll just put it in the sea. That's where it belongs. He's not so worried about polluting with the plane there, but... That's Namor. Anyway, there you go. The end. Maybe we'll look at uh, another one of these Jack Kirby Stanley Treasury Editions another time. But that's been our superhero spotlight for this week on good old Namor of Atlantis. We'll see you next time. Like, subscribe, comment below. What are some of your favorite Namor storylines? Find all my links, Twitter, all that stuff when my graphic novel is available. Buy it. Thanks. Mate!